Yeah, good evening until everybody settles in and sit, sit down. I will make a few announcements and we had, have quite a lot to make this week. Um, nobody should say the visual arts are passive on this campus. So <laughs> we want to make a number of announcements and I hope I do it in the right way. I will end with tonight's talk, but I will start with tomorrow. Tomorrow we have a special event. Um, uh, tactical design and ecology, uh, actually in the cube, and um, it will be first from five to seven, um, kind of um, intro event with Natalie Cherimienko, and then later it will be joined by our alumnus Matthew Mazzotta, and you find all the information, so you just basically get immersed, and then outside you can pick up all the folders, so you don't need to write it down. Um, so you will, tomorrow it will be Natalie Chermienko and um, Matthew Mazzotta as a guest of uh, Nitin Sonny's uh, course, and that will be in the Cube. Um, then um, an ongoing exhibition uh, in the Wall Gallery, which is part of the School of Architecture and Planning. Um, there is an exhibition, The Learning Machine by Urbona Studio, Gediminas and Nomeda Urbonas, um, having... Um, show two works like Ruta that goes back to Ruta Remake and um, now you have to help me, Germinas, where are you? It's Ruta Remake and Transaction and um, I hope you go over there too and see it and this show is up until April 8th and it's really, it shows um, already in a practice what we are talking about tonight, uh, what is artistic practice and what is artistic research and investigation, and where is this different maybe to other practices? So I really encourage you to go and see this exhibition. Later this weekend, you can either participate in uh, a workshop or um, come uh, on President's Day and see the result of that workshop, and that is um, a special collaboration between John Bell's class, the performance workshop, and uh, the Bread and Puppet, a Lubberland National Dance Company. They present Manning, eight dances for the soldier who brought a helicopter massacre in Baghdad to the light of a day. And um, it's directed by um, the Bread and Puppet director, um, Peter Schumann, which is amazing. And I really thank also John Bell to facilitate that. And that will also take place in the cube. Now I want to come to our own uh, lecture series, Coalition 2, When Artistic and Scientific Research Meet. Uh, this is the um, second in that series. And I'm very pleased to announce this in collaboration uh, and with uh, support of the Siemens Stiftung in Munich. We also have in parallel an exhibition that is in different phases, uh, growing up and slowing down in between in the lobby of E14, that is the new building of the Media Lab complex built by Fumihiko Maki on the other side of this building. And uh, currently on stage is already Attila Churki and uh, Georgi Kepisch. Um, Kepisch, you all might know, has been the founder of the Center for Advanced Visual Studies. And um, we also are in charge of the archive and kind of um, be part of a merger between the visual arts program and the center that has been very uh, influential and very um, significant in facilitating artistic research in collaborating with scientists, engineers, and um, yeah, between visual artists, but also the performative arts. And um, we focus this term in the lecture series also on what is this artistic research and often have respondents from the scientific field. In this relation, I also want to thank uh, our team at ACT and uh, especially Laura Pallone, uh, who has been in, is in charge of public programs at ACT and also Lisa Hickler and uh, Chris Klepper, who also supports us with technical um, advice. Um, again, uh, just a quick overview. On tonight's speaker, Florian Dombois, I will come in a minute, but we will have on the 28th of um, February, Guillermo Fajvovic and Nicolas Goldberg, two Buenos Aires-based artists, uh, joining us. Then um, on the, the 3rd of, the 7th of March, Laurent Grasson from France. On the 14th uh, of um, March, uh, Jerem Lee, again an alumna of our program and a recent ACT fellow. Uh, on the 28th of March, we have uh, Ricardo Dominguez, again in collaboration with the course of Nitin Sony and the Center for Future Civic Media. 
And um, then as a closing uh, bracket, kind of also uh, Attila Churgi, who has been the inauguration um, artist for the Artistic Research Collaboration. Uh, but now I want to introduce Florian Dombois. Uh, with Florian, I work quite a while on um, an ongoing debate on what is artistic research, uh, discussing um, what is the terminology that we open up here, where are differences um, to experiments, to inquiry, to scientific research, and where do we position ourselves in a research institute with artistic investigations. Uh, Florian Dombois is an artist who has focused on landforms, liability, seismic and tectonic activity, scientific and technical fictions, as well um, as has been, and he has as well focused on their various representational and media formats. In order to extend his artistic development, uh, Florian studied also geophysics and philosophy in Berlin, Kiel, and Hawaii. That's quite a stretch over the globe, and in his dissertation, What is an Earthquake?, he undertook a comparison of historical and contemporary artistic and scientific representations of earthquakes, and it developed the art as research, and developed an art as research methodology. Since 2003, he is a professor at the Bern University of the Arts and founded the Institute Y for Transdisciplinary Exchange between Arts in Research and Teaching. In 2010, he received the German Sound uh, Art Prize and he currently lives in Cologne and Bern. And last but not least, he has been um, very instrumental in getting a peer-reviewed uh, journal um, uh, started the CHAR, Journal of Artistic Research, that um, compiles about 30 universities and art academies um, around the globe to really put on a serious measure on um, artistic investigation and research, and the peer reviews are done not by art, uh, art historians, but by artists uh, themselves. So please welcome Florian Dombois. should be on now. Okay, so um, four, three, two, one, action. <laughs> um, thanks for the invitation, um, inviting me here to come to here and allow me to have also uh, a special thank to a colleague of mine, Peter Kiefer, a sound artist and a professor from University of Mainz, where I was a research fellow last half of year and I, they greatly supported me. So allow me to announce that here too. I'm very happy to be here in the series of uh, what is called Collision 2, when artistic and scientific research meet. And this topic is very much in my heart, at my heart. And when Ute asked me uh, to come, I said, yeah, wh what, what shall I tell? And she, um, uh, she sent me a growing list of topics, and I had also another thing that I would like to add. And in the end, now it's uh, quite a long agenda, I must confess. And I hope we get through that, and you forgive me, or you, you stop me if I'm going too long for that. Uh, I will stick on the 35 minutes, so it's... Uh, <laughs> Um, you can't, yeah, I will do that. I will do it in, um, uh, in three steps. So first, um, Uta asked me to give you a short overview on the more or less institutional ac uh, activities I've done. So I will report very briefly on the Institute uh, for Artistic Research I'm uh, running in Switzerland, which is called Y. Uh, and give there two examples of projects that are concerned about, uh, especially um, modes of displaying artistic research. Then I will do um, a second part in, the, in, the, uh, in my talk where I want to um, give uh, some proposal of how one might want to define artistic research. And that not for restriction, but for actually for stimulating discussion afterwards, because I know that it's much easier to fight if, uh, if you have some um, clear definitions. And then uh, in the end, after, um, I will, uh, will do a third part in my talk and will close uh, with mentioning two of my own works of 
an artistic or artist, uh, uh, of myself as an artistic or artist's researcher. There was a debate here uh, between uh, Elisa Opitas and Gina Badger, and so we might want to discuss on that too. All right, um, please excuse my heavy accent. You probably have already recognized I'm not a native speaker, but I hope you will nevertheless get to that. So my first, um, first part is um, I founded in 2003, Ute mentioned already, an institute in Switzerland that is called Y, subtitle Ardes Research. At the, those days, a uh, very young, um, uh, whoops, um, very young uh, academy of, uh, or university of the arts. So it's called Y as the letter, um, letter Y. And um, let's see, now that everything seemed to have changed again. So, sorry for that. There's, ah, here it is, a picture. So this is the web address. And this, um, uh, uh, this when, I was uh, when I started, I was only my own uh, being employed half day. So it was, so to say, a half person institute. Um, and since now uh, it grew up to I'm um, having now almost 100 people on the pay list. And it was originally founded only for teaching, so the, the duty was to uh, bring people from the visual arts, sound, uh, from literature, music and so on in teaching together. And it was, uh, I give you an idea of how the, um, the organization is structured, is. so you have these kind of different departments in that school that are ranging from art, design, music, literature, opera, theater, conservation, restoration. And then the Institute Y was you know, transversal to that. So uh, the main, first thing I did was setting up this kind of teaching program for all students. Everybody receiving a BA or MA goes through that program. So it's like 550 courses a semester. And the whole school has like 800 students. So they all go through that. Then second, uh, in the meantime, uh, there was founded a new BA, uh, MA, a master program, uh, where it was decided to have the fine arts, the literature and the music and media art, not in separate uh, uh, master, uh, uh, but in one master that is called contemporary arts practice. And uh, this is also part of the institute. So you have a, um, a transdisciplinary uh, reality uh, on that level too. And um, uh, uh, because the concept and the name of the institute I gave in the beginning, which was Art as Research in 2003, uh, I became involved very much in uh, also setting up the research on that school. It was kind of a, a request for the uh, university. And today we have uh, about, I would say, 30 projects at a time running, 30 research projects. And they are... Uh, uh, um, collected around four uh, research clusters. So you have intermediality, interpretation, communication, design, and materiality. And they're explicitly thought not as belonging to one of the uh, traditional artistic disciplines, but transversal. Nevertheless, some of them have a you know, gravitational uh, center in one of the disciplines. So to give you an example, uh, uh, and in materiality, it's, uh, it's a lot of research done from the restoration conservation area. They would investigate into new media art and how to conserve these intangible um, uh, uh, web art, for instance, or how to conserve uh, video art uh, while, while all the new formats are coming up, Active Archive. Or there's another project, it's called Intermateriality, it's more uh, humanities based where people think about the interaction between materials and there are artists and uh, uh, humanity people working together on the interaction of materi materials and in their meanings. Another, if you look to interpretation, uh, that is a, a research cluster that is uh, concerned about lots in music and lots in literature, questions of you know how to um, uh, have an historically in informed performance of 19th century music. Um, for instance, there was a, a big change in the trumpet uh, um, in 19th century. The old uh, Klappen trompete, the old type trumpet, uh, all the composers wrote for that old 
trumpet, but today we have a totally different uh, trumpet, and they are investigating on that relation of what is the influence of that old instrument. And then we have uh, musicians working together with uh, instrument builders, but also with um, hist music historians. Or communication design, designing rumors as a kind of um, difficulty. Uh, if you have, for instance, in areas where you lose uh, public informational systems, like in disasters, the only thing you can rely on are rumors, and you might want to design them to get the right information through, even in difficult situations. <coughs> or in intermediality, uh, there are typical projects. One is called um, uh, uh, on trance, um, if you go, go into trance, um, a, a researcher, a scientific researcher is a bit in, in trouble because then he loses his identity in a way. So, and an artist might lose it not so much if he is in trance. So we thought, we, we did a project on how to experience and how to depict or to, 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 uh, um, to make a, 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 a description of what is it if, when you are in trance. And, and part of the group was, or most of the group was, coming from the arts and making uh, video art pieces and so on. Or another one is uh, called uh, On the Wilderness. Um, in Switzerland there's a problem, there is the growing wilderness. You won't believe, but there's like four square kilometers every year more wilderness. This was you see is not wilderness, it's very designed, but there's more and more coming real wilderness. So the, uh, Swiss can't really uh, control reality enough. And um, this uh, kind of wilderness is very much influenced by our pictures and ideas of what we imagine wilderness has to look like. And this comes very much from the 19th century romantics, influenced by pic uh, uh, painters like uh, Caspar David Friedrich and so on. And so the project was about how would a today artist uh, make pictures about what is wilderness and how this would influence people from tourism and so on and so on. So running say this artistic production an essential of the research and uh, and uh, one reason certainly is because we are an art school the best thing we do we can do is art uh, so there's one good reason to introduce uh, include that but the other one is I'm personally convinced and this is uh, the topic of this whole series here, I'm personally convinced that artistic productions can be seen as forms of research or as knowledge oriented or as heading for understanding, which is a major debate and I will return to it later. Um, technically, that means that in the Institute I'm having almost every research project uh, artist integrated. So all these uh, projects are having um, artist in that um, um, uh, uh, in that in that courses and there was a book published uh, last year on the, all these hundred projects we've done in the last seven years which I didn't bring because it was on the one hand very heavy and on the other hand it's German so if you are interested I can give you the web link and then you can uh, see uh, have a closer look to that so um, if you do these kind of projects and, and you are um, uh, producing art within these projects, then after, uh, after the first project you already start thinking about, yeah, but how do they go on display? I mean, how do you, uh, do, you do an exhibition as a research result of that uh, project? Or do you go on stage with it? Or, you know, this is one part. And then the other one is, as uh, research is a lot about, you know, handing from one researcher to the next, the question is how to integrate uh, or how to start the discourse. And uh, so I uh, uh, discussed or thought a lot about what would be a room, uh, uh, an appropriate room, if we think of a visual art production as a part of a research project, what has a room would have to look like where you put on display one art piece and where you want to have a start a discourse on that. So I asked, um, uh, um, uh, and, and the cl it, it, it claims to be research. So I asked Iran Scherf, an artist and also a, um, a trained architect, uh, and cooperated with the Kunsthalle Bern to, to develop with, with him um, 
a room that is designed for putting artistic research onto display and start discourse uh, on that. And um, the design he came up with, in the end, I want to uh, give as one of the examples of projects we are doing, is this, um, which uh, you see is, is, a, is now only, it's, it consists of, uh, uh, of one room that is put into two by a paravan in between, and where you have on the one hand a camera projecting on the other hand, uh, on the other side, the, the, the taken image. And on the other side, you have a camera too, which is projecting the uh, same image on the other side. And then there you have somebody who is deciding, something like a video jockey, deciding which picture he want or she wants to take out. And to make it less abstract, um, I brought some pictures from uh, one of our last test sessions with uh, some works. Here you see that kind of paravan between where uh, the audience is sitting here. Uh, it was a performance piece, so the art is happening on the other side. And uh, these people are not following it directly, they are following it on a mediated uh, um, uh, concern. So it's in a way you could say a merge between a classroom or, or, or something like a room like here, on the one hand where you have a lecture situation and on the other hand you have an exhibition room. This was another, we did another performance uh, here. You can see the cameras and then uh, because people don't want to stand away then they start to walk around and there's a whole uh, uh, kind of awareness of who is on what position and so on, which is pretty interesting, I think. Um, there's also one thing that surprised me here. This is actually Iran uh, with a green shirt, easy to recognize. Um, that um, it is a little bit um, a, a closed-in feeling. So this guy wanted to escape that, and, they, uh, and this girl didn't let him out. So he was really pushing the, the door handles, but they didn't let him go. <laughs> and then, in the end, uh, he got out. So um, this was one uh, project, and then they, we published um, a small art book on that, and I brought that with me, so you can have a look on that if you want to. Another concern, if you are um, uh, producing this kind of artworks within research project, is where do they go after they have been shown? I mean, you, you do an exhibition and then it's away. And especially, uh, uh, how, how, how do you, can you store them or you might want to quote them? I mean, you want to refer to them and others want to refer to them too. And then uh, uh, in 2009, Mike, Michael Schwab from London, an artist and researcher, approached me and asked uh, if I would have fun to, uh, to, to found a journal. And actually, I had some of these ideas already in my pocket and put them out immediately, said, you're my man. I organized the money. And now we go for that. And so we both, uh, both brought that together and integrated also uh, Hank Borgdorf and made a call for that kind of journal for artistic research, whoever would be interested in that. And that was uh, a little bit than a year uh, ago, beginning of 2010. And we got an immense reaction, I don't know, 500 uh, males and, and, and immediately like 60, 80, you know, 67 institutions reacted and said, yeah, we want to have this kind of journal. And so we, um, uh, 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 we founded um, um, a society a year ago um, for artistic research as a backbone carrier for that, uh, which has uh, a lot of institutions in it. It's like uh, Max Planck Institute for Wissenschaftsgeschichte, so the science history department, uh, but also the Van Abbe Museum, it's uh, Ute, it's a lot of art schools who are doing artistic research. And uh, they're coming from Europe, Australia, and the US mainly. Now, um, uh, let's see if it, uh, we are just um, a few days before release. So they couldn't promise me uh, if this would, um, let's see, if this would work. They are still on that, uh, on that website. So 
I will try to, no, it's not working, so it doesn't matter. Um, um, uh, uh, I can describe it to you, and I will do, uh, give you an, um, a small uh, a picture of the design. So if you look in the next, I don't know, five, six days up on that website, www.jar-online.net, you will find what I, I have to describe verbally. So um, what is the idea behind it? The idea behind this that is that uh, we have a journal, an online journal, and that, uh, uh, that this journal is on top of a research catalog. So you have a catalog where you can enter uh, one of your artistic research projects. And, uh, and this uh, software would store and assemble all the multimedia content with what you want to uh, document it. And uh, it is following Dublin Core, so conservation of standards of art documentation. It's really trying to be there on the high level. Uh, but we don't want to only to document it, uh, uh, because, um, but making it itself an argument within the journal. So it is not only to buy, to put some, you know, some videos of what had happened in there, but trying to make the artistic research as good as possible as you can do on a web uh, um, present, and we call that exposition or you might call it unfolding artistic ideas with these contributions. So the idea is, is that knowledge formulation is not only verbal and then being illustrated by pictures, but that it can happen within pictures, within video, can happen within audio, so that you can organize your article or, or your argumentation not around one center text and have some images around that you can have visual essays. So this um, software tries to uh, uh, take care of that. And this is pretty technically also very challenging. So we had a major project in the last year uh, on developing this software that is, you have to imagine like, if you want to make a contribution, you have a table and you can put your parts on it. So there's no hierarchy of you know, going in columns up and down. You can choose for the design, uh, lots of design. And then you organize, like on this kind of empty canvas or empty table, your argumentation. And then you uh, uh, apply for becoming, uh, uh, you know, you want to come into that journal. And then the second phase starts, which is a reviewing phase. So then uh, uh, other artists, referees, look on that and, and start a discussion with you on, uh, on the quality of it. So it's really the idea of uh, peer reviewing. Now, this is also very challenging because how to review artistic research, nobody has any experience with that. Or how to review an article that is not written, but is a visual essay. How do you interact with that? So there are a lot of kind of interesting questions. Also, what are the criteria? How to organize these kind of processes? Uh, uh, and who does it and how? Do we do it double blind, single blind? Do we do it, I don't know, um, uh, open review, and so on and so on. So uh, um, uh, you have to, to what, look it up and think, uh, see what we made out of that. Um, there's also this, this, um, uh, uh, this, this, uh, this research catalog is also having the idea behind that there might other journals having other ideas of quality. So you register your project in that research catalog and JAR picks up out only the best, what this editorial team thinks are the best. But there might be other people saying, oh no, they, you are doing totally stupid. We work with the same research catalog, but we make another selection. So there's a kind of a competition on quality, hopefully, on that in the future as well. Um, yeah, so there's a, a, a society meeting in, a, in, a, uh, in, 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 in the beginning of uh, March, so you're pretty much invited if you want to come and uh, hit that hot debate. There's also an online forum where people fight for what is good and what is not good. 
and should be a reviewer, should be not, and how to restrict art and how to, how to free it again and so on and so on. But so I would say, describe it also as, as a very much a social um, um, movement at the moment of many people trying to improve. And I'm uh, pretty convinced that um, it is not ready as it is now. It is really like on the go. And I would be happy if you would go into that too. Uh, so I would uh, sum up JAR is, is about quoting reviewing and forming a community of experts as one of the main concerns. So this is the institutional part. I talked a lot, you know, I see you are, you're, it's, institutions are boring, aren't they? So, <laughs> so I stopped that report and uh, um, come to my second part. Uh, uh, one of the reasons why I did these kind of two initiatives like uh, Palava and Jaha was that I, uh, whenever you go to artistic research conferences, everybody's talking about theory and nobody talks about examples. So I'm pretty bored of always this theory. Nevertheless, um, uh, uh, since, and, and I think that, you know, examples are like on the agenda now. Nevertheless, I think um, uh, for discussion, it's sometimes nice to have some theory. And so I uh, pulled out two um, articles uh, and two definitions of artistic research I've done in the past, and uh, we might want to discuss on them. Um, so the first one is, is um, trying to describe on what kind of relations, you know, what kind of um, relations you can have between art and research. And there is a very famous paper uh, by, an, uh, uh, by a British um, design and head of the Royal College who, who described uh, that there are three different modes of how re research can react on art, saying one is research on art, one is research for the arts, and one is research through the arts. This has been heavily debated in the last years. I will give you examples in a minute. But I think it's very typical because nobody of these guys ever talks about the opposite. There's certainly also art reacts on research. There might be also art for research. And there might be also art through research. So um, I would like to uh, give examples for all of these six uh, to initiate better understanding of how research from science and how art might come together. The classical way, which was you know, invented in the 19th century, is that there's research done on art. If you go to a literature in the humanities, many, you know, art history, music history, they are doing research on art. So this example I'm having here is the Beethoven archive. They're doing research on an artist, so pretty much traditional. Sometimes it's nice if research is done for the arts. This example I'm having here is a uh, is a special organ. Usually organs are digital, so you have on and off. And if you have a piano, piano, it's, uh, res um, uh, you can hit it harder or less hard. So uh, our school wanted to have an organ that is reacting on that too. So we employed technicians to develop that organ for us. And now we have uh, scientific research done for the arts. Another way. Um, uh, is there are a lot of artists uh, making art on research. So if there's, for instance, this writer Friedrich Dürrenmatt, he wrote a play on physicists uh, making an art or a theater play about and somebody from research. Or Jarret wrote an opera on Galilei, or Bertolt Brecht wrote a piece on Galilei too. So yeah, so artists are taking concern on research. But what they do is art. It's not maybe not directly research. Uh, I took an example from MIT as well, is once in a while research employs art to help them. Uh, for instance, this project was um, to, to use music to improve diseases or to you know, medical uh, treatment of people. And so there was a research project on that. 
Alzheimer disease and autism and emotions and so on and so on and so art was used for uh, research questions. Now I want to go uh, to the more interesting part as I think. <laughs> Stop here. This is a project of a colleague of mine, Peter Ablinger, who uh, used an automatic piano, a mechanical piano, and analyzed voice and made the um, uh, piano play that voice. So what you've heard was no voice, it was only piano. So he used technology very much and did a frequency analysis of language to make that piece. And you can't, I can't really decide whether it's a scientific research uh, uh, investigation on voice or is it more an artistic investigation on voice. So I would call that art through research because it's done very technically, very scientifically, the setup, but the result is art. A very wonderful piece of um, uh, 10 minutes. And then you can do it vice versa, uh, and I want to take here an historic example of uh, Rusolo, this guy who, uh, part of, who was part of the movement of futurists, who, uh, um, who decided that all traditional music is wrong, and we have to give up on instruments, we need noise. Noise is the music of the future. So he developed new instruments for producing noises and then uh, he was so involved in that and then he, after developing all these instruments he said oh we need also a new kind of scores. So he developed scores for that and he dedicated his whole life on developing a whole, total new system of, of new instruments, new um, notations, combination between traditional orchestra and, and, and so on and so on. So I would call that research through art because it tells a lot uh, uh, also about sound and acoustics and so on and so on. So um, you might now say, yeah, that's, my, that's good, but uh, if you call that art through research and research through art, artistic research, you know, where is it good for? What might be potential of it? And I see at the moment, I see three areas where I think it's pretty interesting to work together. One thing is the as aspect of representation. Science is used to represent only on sheet of paper and Times New Roman and very, you know, having some illustrations. But if you open that idea up and if you think about how only to depict how to represent and something um, and you use really all the kind of media, then you're already in a research area because the, uh, the way you represent something is already focusing and, and guiding the art of what you will find later. So in this kind of area, I think cooperation is pretty interesting. And the second one is um, the specific versus the general. Science has a problem with its specific. The history is always studying, you know, the total, the, the, the community. It's very difficult to deal with the exception with the biography. And there's also a problem of coming from the biography to the to, to general history and vice versa. Whereas, for instance, arts, uh, in the arts, um, you write a, a, a poem or an essay about some individual and it stands for a whole era. And the example I hear, we had here um, was um, a guy, oh, I tell that play, maybe in the discussion. <laughs> And then the third one is models. Arts works a lot, uh, science works a lot with models. And they are very fictional and, and uh, very crazy sometimes. Especially, I like, for instance, um, a lot astronomy. You know, you can't go there, but they have really wild ideas about white dwarfs and black holes and everything. And all these models are fictional. And, and, and inventing these models is a very, um, is a very different attitude of uh, producing knowledge than the idea of you know measuring and making experiments it's really fictional and so on so this was my uh, first talk it was uh, if you want to read on that there was the publication on that now the second talk 
I'm giving now on theory is um, um, is this. Uh, you see that is a little older talk, so it's from 2006. <laughs> um, there's, uh, and it has been published and a lot of people reacted on that. There's a lot of people saying, you know, all the art is research. And I find that a little bit boring because why do you need that term, artistic research? And then the other people are saying, oh, no art is ever research. I find that boring too. <laughs> Uh, so uh, I try to somehow define the area in between. And um, I, I wrote a manifest uh, which consists of 10 uh, paragraphs, 10 laws. Uh, um, and I will go through, very fast through them. And uh, the idea was behind it to, to help myself uh, how would I define what makes art research. So my first line is that if you want to make research in the arts, you will need to have an interest, an epistemological drive, something like that. You want to understand. And the second law goes with it, and then you say, and you give, and you name it. You also say, what is, what is this, what you're hunting for? So the example I'm showing here is that Gerhard Richter might want to investigate on that portrait. And then there's this book of him uh, called Atlas, where he's is not displaying a lot of the material that is behind that kind of investigation. And the third paragraph is um, knowledge is formulated within the respective art form. That means you choose uh, whatever medium you want to go with. And it becomes clear with the next one why this is important. Because if you choose different media representation, you can uh, combine new groupings. So it's not only that uh, those people who are from one discipline are uh, researching on something, but you can have different disciplines. Here the example is uh, uh, the research on earthquakes. This is a piece by, by uh, Josef Beuys done uh, Terremoto in, in the uh, 1970s in Italy. This is a very nice piece by Walter de Maria on the importance of natural disasters. This is a drawing from earthquakes from 16th, 16th century. So you can group them on topics, even though they have totally different media. Or you can even go with, uh, with sound like this, which is an audification of earthquake data. Then um, an interesting part is, is uh, research is done by many people, not only one person. I'm not saying that every art production that is researched needs to be done by many artists. I'm only saying that there's always, it's from one going to, to many. There are many people doing research for other people who are also working with research. So there's always a group around you, and you react on that. Then the question uh, is, how is evaluation or peer reviewing done? That's carried out by experts. And I would say um, an artistic research should be artistic researchers and not art historians or art critics directly. Uh, usually, we have this game that the artists do something and then they keep their mouth shut. And then comes the critic, the, the god in white or gold or black. No, the god in black, probably. The god in black comes and says. <laughs> and I think uh, in artistic research, we should do that, organize this all by ourselves. Then uh, this is. Uh, Anyway, a concern of artists is you do research and make yourself, you make the research public. Um, uh, you made it accessible, exhibition or whatsoever. Then you might discuss on uh, quality. Now this is, uh, uh, this, I'm, I'm not so sure about this anymore because I'm pretty nervous about the idea of stable quality criteria in the arts. So I would maybe formulate that a little different. But I would say in the, the, you should discuss on what your idea of quality is. It's a little bit like in, uh, if you take new students in the art class, you also discuss on the better and the less good. And if you're taking the degrees, you're also discussing. And then there might be more open criteria and so on. But there is always a discussion on quality in research, I would say. And then the whole discussion of what, what is the state of the art. 
I mean, you want to improve somehow, you want to do something, then you can't do the same. There was a famous uh, battle between Christian Markley and, um, and uh, Gerhard Richter, because Gerhard Richter used the picture of Christian, uh, no, it was not, uh, Carsten Nikolai, sorry, not Christian Markley, because Carsten Nikolai did these pictures. And uh, uh, Richter wanted to use them, and Nikolai said, okay, you can use them if you mention me myself in the title. And then the show was put on display, and he didn't. So he had a he sued Richter, and he had to put the, they had to put the pictures down because it was not state of the art because he just you know used them. And um, this uh, manifesto, um, I had like these nine laws, and I thought I wanted to have ten like Moses, so I made also tens up. <laughs> which is maybe less important, but um, uh, uh, the, the idea of question and answer. I think research is not only about answers. It's also about putting up questions and raising questions. So I formulated that artistic research might be something like the questioning part against uh, science. Uh, but as I said, I needed 10. So <laughs> All right, then. Um, this is, uh, uh, Uta asked me to do some definitional work, though. This is my definitional work of what my ideas are on artistic research. And so I'm uh, coming now to the, my third and last part. And uh, I want to relate a little bit to so far what I've said so far now with my own artistic practice, and especially uh, with two uh, projects of mine. And if you want to know more, there's just a book came out, uh, a major catalog of my last 10 years, which I'm having with me. So I will only focus on um, two projects. The first one uh, um, uh, I want to mention is called Horizon with Seven Hills. It was already, uh, um, it was already on the poster of tonight, so you might have seen it. And uh, you know, whenever I am in a in a in a museum, I'm really much fan of these um, uh, these thermohygrographs. You know, these little machines that measure uh, measure the um, measure the uh, 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 temperature and the, the the moisture. And I sometimes go to them and ask for their opinion on the neighboring art. You know, they're always, you know, on the side. And uh, they document, they are a document of stability, and, and they are the only pieces that are allowed in white cubes. You know, usually everything is talked out, taken out, but these stay, so they're really nice, I think. And uh, if, you have a, uh, if you have them around your art piece, it means that people take care about your art, and so it's highly rated on the art market, <laughs> if you have something. So I, what I did with this machine, I, I, I bought myself such a machine and used it as a drawing machine uh, with kind of two drawers. Uh, and and uh, I took away from that paper the grid. So I'm having I used only plain, plain paper because I was not interested in measurements, but on the, on the, uh, on the process of drawing. And I placed it, as you can see here, I placed it not inside the gallery, but on the, on the window. So, so to say, uh, on the threshold between inside the white cube, or inside the museum, and outside the white cube. Now, um, uh, uh, this place is a place of extreme climate. Because of the sun, you have a daily heavy going up and a heavy going down. So it's really like the very difficult area. Uh, and uh, and I tuned it, uh, I tuned the, the uh, circulation so that it took the machine now seven days to record one page. That and in the end you have seven mountains or seven hills, and seven valleys uh, by that. And it is uh, interestingly enough this climate is even worse than outside. So it's really like uh, outside it's it's a little bit up and down, and this, in the mid in, inside should be stable. And that one is really like going mad in between. And um, interestingly enough, I tried to photograph the resulting uh, pictures 
but the uh, neon paper doesn't allow. So this is a drawing, but you, <laughs> you don't see that. This is one machine. Uh, uh, and I would say, call that somehow uh, something like a specific panorama, a panorama of two lines with an upper more escalated uh, um, horizon and a less oscillating below. And for me, it corresponds a bit to Chinese scroll paintings. That's why I called it uh, Horizon for Seven Hills. That is the one piece. And then the second piece I want to refer to is called um, uh, Lukens Land. And again, my, uh, the, the uh, starting fascination, oh, let's, maybe I should, you see, the, so you see it here also. So my fascination was, uh, again, for uh, measuring instruments. I like seismometers very much, they, how they draw. I don't know if you have seen it, they really draw very constantly. Like this. So, so not too fast, but also not too slow. Um, they're uh, very precise, they're never doubting. You know, they always know what they do. They really like painting, this is it. Much more sure than me. And the curve, curve they produce is uh, never repeating. This is always new. There's no seismic curve repeated. So it's kind of a never-ending melody. And uh, for that project, I brought it into the Kunsthalle Bern and placed it on the floor. So you, um, so you see that here. Uh, uh, the seismometer was just placed on the ground. And I wondered what the, Kunst, uh, the floor of the Kunsthalle would uh, tell us. So I used two. This is uh, uh, one and the second one. So the first one goes to a, widget, uh, to a visual display, really like writing it down, and the second one was a digital uh, uh, data recording. And I uh, started it at the vernissage, and I stopped it at the finissage, so it was the seven weeks exhibition, so it was running through that. And I used the digital part to uh, uh, become a set of audio uh, CDs um, where you can listen to that. Now, there were several things coming out of this project. I want to mention only two things. Um, uh, one thing was um, uh, that I, uh, um, uh, that, the, that, that the building of the Kunsthalle is at a slope. So it's, uh, you have the river down and then there's this building on that slope. And uh, because of the tension you have when you are building on the slope, this whole building has a crack just in the middle. Um, uh, so one half is going down the hill and the other one is still there. And uh, uh, if you would sit on that installation here, you would have just opposite uh, the empty wall, and you would sit that, see that crack going just through that whole building, and you would jump a little bit on the, on the middle between the going down part, very slowly, but nevertheless, very slowly going down part, and the upper part. And, um, and the Kunsthalle team already uh, told me just uh, some time ago that since this uh, project, they are always looking for that crack. So because it's going through the whole building, and they are always trying to be on the upper side, <laughs> and they're in the better than on the lower one. And then uh, the second uh, thing that came out of this project is uh, I have to maybe to explain the term uh, uh, Lukensland is an old German term for clairvoyance, for foreseer, for profit, but also for watchtowers or belvederes, or you could uh, translate it directly and say, look into the land. Look into the land means look into the land. So the object was placed, as you see here, at the dead end of the exhibition room. So it was actually an area where you couldn't look out anymore. And just at the end, instead for you uh, being able to look into the country, the machine or the instrument would look out. So you would have, through that seismometer, the opportunity to, to see what you behind the wall. And I wondered uh, um, how far can you see if you put a seismometer on a wooden floor? I mean, a, seismometer, a seismologist would never put that. I mean, that's really a poor thing. You wouldn't do that. Uh, uh, 
and and so I I looked on these kind of recordings and and I saw that uh, you see that there's at least for instance all the tra car traffic and the trams around the Kunsthalle is very much seeable. But I also uh, investigated closer to it and uh, used reference seismometers and was able um, to uh, pick earthquake recordings from Kamchatka. So. Um, uh, the museum, there's a museum in Switzerland reacting on seismic events on this uh, other side of the earth. All right, um, we are coming to the close, uh, to the end of my talk. Uh, your series is called uh, When Artistic and Scientific Research Meet. And let me close with a little story that we in Europe tell each other when, uh, about the new world across the Atlantic, Stephen knows it, um, there's a cowboy uh, riding through the prairie and at the horizon he sees an Indian and so he makes like, and then the Indian reacts on it, him and says, and then the cowboy does, and then the Indian does this, and now they are really a close and then the cowboy does this. So the cowboy comes home and says, oh, these Indians, you know. I said to him, you know, if you ride further, I'm going to kill you. And then he said to me, I'm going to kill you. And I said, I'll kill you twice. And he said, I make your grave. And I said, oh, go away. And then the Indian comes at home and said, oh, white man, they are really crazy. You know, he asked me, what's your name? I said, what's your name? And he said, my name is Goat. And I said, Mountain Goat? No, river goat. <laughs> Thank you. Hear me? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, the, 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 the goal of, of these evenings is usually also to bring um, artists and um, scientists in a dialogue. So I'm not really a scientist, I'm just here now more um, within a scientific research institution. But I thought as a startup of this debate, it might be quite interesting <coughs> to bring in this point of departure. And I thank you very much for. Um, your contribution and, and to see really also to discuss a little bit what is the difference like if you if we deal with artistic research within an art institution versus um, artistic research and the position of artists within a scientific institution because it's also a different point of departure and um, I'm also very glad to have um, Otto Pina here uh, who directed 20 years the Center for Advanced Visual Studies and I think during um, Otto's time in the center, it was very much also an engagement, and prove me if I, tell me if I'm saying something wrong, but it was an effort, how can uh, scientists and artists together um, investigate or create something different? How do scientists get inspired by, by the presence of artists? And how does scientific research and science inspired the arts and artists. So it was kind of a cross-pollination and, and what can they create together. And um, so that was for me very interesting. And when <coughs> Georgi Kepesh came here, I think he was also very interested in um, having a presence of an artistic voice in a scientific institution. Because um, the artist also contributes as an intellectual as a critical voice in um, what is necessary to investigate in this world. So the question is also why are we doing research? I mean like so I think it's also to go back and um, you claim also some you, you put up some uh, statements and, and I thought it's very interesting to discuss the different 
parameters where art and research can meet in different configurations. And um, I think, to me, it's very interesting to see that uh, in, in our context, which is a, a little different one, because, for example, your students might be art students in a wider sense or so. The majority of our students are students who study everything but art, despite of our small graduate program. And I think that's, so for us, our role is slightly different here, but I think it's interesting to see what potentials those um, institutes have, like the Y, the Institute for Transdisciplinary Research, and now ACT has um, emerged uh, um, as a collaboration between the Center for Advanced Visual Studies and the Visual Arts Program. Yeah, we are a little bit in, adva uh, in advantage of, you know, we are usually uh, really in the material world. <laughs> so the lecture hall is, uh, it's very rare that I'm working with students in a lecture hall. They can't actually, nobody really likes to follow a talk longer than 20 minutes. And uh, so we are more in, a, in the, in the, in the uh, working room and we're trying to do um, this kind of research by hand, but uh, trying to, to work on projects, productions, to make something real, make something uh, tangible, make something uh, into the hands. And so why, that's also why I'm always a little bit afraid to give lectures like this tonight, because you already know that it's so comfortable to sit and it's warm. And it's always this kind of slide that you can't touch, you know, it can do a little bit of interference, but <laughs> this is all, it's all so flat. And, and I wonder how we, um, uh, how to, to change these kind of arrangements of how people um, come together and, and, and trying to exchange. And that's why I said, I think the, the whole discussion about what artistic research is, is one thing, but the other thing is really to bring things and say, this is my result. And I think that's pretty cool, and I'll react on that. And yeah, I think that's interesting to do. But you brought it up already, and I think this is, um, you mentioned the notion of criteria and quality. And um, again, I would say within an art school, the discussion on that is slightly different than here, because like, just if you take um, faculty here or students, their evaluation follows the same institute standards than you would have for other disciplines. So if you have tenure cases here at MIT or so, like a day going, as you mentioned, peer reviews, etc. how do you measure an artistic achievement here in a scientific community? Oh. How do you evaluate what is an achievement? Um, how do you discuss this on when like debates are going on in um, the higher administration that is a combination of engineers, scientists, um, School of Humanities, etc. On the opposite, we are also here and evaluate scientific achievements. So how can we find even um, an understanding of the different practices that we have? You know, and you mentioned the expert. I mean, like, in the majority of cases, we are not experts here. But that's yeah. a little different if you are at least within an art institution. Yeah, but don't you think, I mean, I think the, the whole idea of measuring uh, research output is also for science very dangerous. I mean, it's, it's this kind of uh, bringing things too much down to a countable level. There is this saying that apparently in, in chemistry, uh, uh, you have to correct me, or oh, no, medicine, I think it's the worst. The medicine, there, there is this picture of a bookshelf, and every year there is produced, I don't know, two meters of new books with new knowledge. Now, with every year coming two meters new knowledge on it, there's like one and a half falling down because being wrong. So there's this kind of current, uh, uh, that it's not really true that scientific knowledge is a kind of building up, building up, building up, and measurable, uh, clear uh, knowing. So I would like to pick more the idea of evaluation, which is, an, I personally, I think a different thing discussion on what is good and what is not good, what is to follow and what is not to follow, and, and, and not too much on, on saying, you know, uh, one publication in a peer-reviewed journal and then a second one and, and somebody who's having like 10 is better than somebody's having two and so on. So I think we have to be a little bit careful to I do would, something I in would, between. 
I would question the I would question the, um, the the criteria of like what is better or what is less good. I, I don't. I always had like problems even when artists evaluated that way. I I would not. I don't think that really grasped like what is um, substantial. You mean when it is, is it, when it's tagged as good afterwards? No, or like uh, if we evaluate work, like do we evaluate like what is better or like this is good or do we evaluate like what we learn new, what we had not understood before, like what is like contributes a different angle. So the, the question is like what is the measurement or what you want to call it, what is the result of an evaluation? And I think that is that is really crucial. And like, mm, so to me, it's, it's still very important to go much more to the beginning, to the motivation. And um, I think it's it's interesting, maybe also to discuss if art is kind of like um, basic research, or versus applied research, etc. So where do we position artistic research? I would say that there are different areas. I like in science you have applied in the basic research. Why why not having the same in arts too? I mean, you can be very applied or you can be very general. But reacting on on the question of um, quality and so on, I I think we are not that far away from each other. I'm not saying that there is a clear outcome of that. I think that this kind of engaging with trying always to find something interesting is a very important move. And I'm nervous about, um, within the artistic research um, people, so to say, there's a lot of people saying uh, it is a, um, it is a uh, practice based and it's, there are a lot about, you know, science, things are going on, process oriented and so on and so on. And personally, I like kind of the idea of a in between stop and uh, where you think now we evaluate or we discuss on and now it's you know the best formulation I can do for the moment and then people react on that and then we go on for, from that again. So if you have the idea of research only as a process, you know, how, how to relate with others. Scientific research is also, it's a process and then you do a publication and the publication is you know people react on that and then the process is restarted again. And I would compare that with uh, uh, an artist work where you also are in the process and once you while you do an exhibition where you have to be precise and where you, you put something into the discourse and then people are reacting on that and then it's starting over again. And I might mean this kind of moment of publication is very interesting also for, for to relate with uh, other research just from other fields because then you can refer to it. If somebody's only saying, oh, I'm in this kind of process and it's so open, then it's very difficult to, to react on that. I mean, of course, we, I don't know if the, do you hear me? Is the microphone working? Because it, it's on, but I don't, I realize maybe I'm too clear. It's working? Okay. Um, I think it's also crucial to, to um, to discuss this because we often have the debate, and I had this in my uh, previous school where we also started a PhD program in the arts, and, and here, like, what's the role of the, the thesis project, the final project? Is, is the thesis, is, is what is made, is it the project itself, or is it the writing part, or is it a combination of the two? And um, again, I think we have it a little easier here because we can compare it with other labs, like with a physics lab, with a biology lab, where of course you make the experiments in the laboratory and that is what you're working on, but of course you publish it or you try to communicate it in order to have a debate about it. Uh. You know, so, so I think sometimes for me, I find it easier here to explain it than it was for me in the art academy uh. to explain why other artists defend their thesis, uh. why they present it in, in a way that it can circulate the question is if the, the book, I mean, we call it here the MIT, there is the book, there is a very clear measurement for each book. If that could, if that is the only format of communicating results, but not only in the arts. Absolutely, in, yeah. in, in every research field. Maybe I should, um, I, I'm using this kind of language with 
sometimes sounds like if I think it is finished and the workpiece is tangible and you have it or something like that. But I, am, uh, uh, I would like to connect that to that famous quote by uh, Beckett, try and fail, try better, fail better. So I think this kind of trying to make something on the point will be failure, I mean, for sure, but you have to do it. I mean, you have to come to a point where, where it is the, all it, as it is. You mean not as an artist? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, re scientific researchers do also, I would say. I think they, I mean, they, <laughs> they fail a lot, don't they? They fail <laughs> and sometimes 10,000 times, while in the arts, they sometimes think if they have done it three times, it should be there. Uh -huh. Like this notion of like um, immersing yourself also in, in a field that you don't need to produce results immediately, that to allowing the time of investigation and one scientist told to me once, like the, the, the end of real uh, scientific innovation or of real research is um, grant writing. That you need to know already the result in order to get a grant, and if you know the result, you cannot research really anymore because there is no open space. And um, so this was on a conference on creativity where artists and scientists meet and uh, met and and they said they look always to the artists who have this open field and they ju just can work. And they said science was at one point like that. Yeah. Where you really get very curiously into something and you, you suddenly you, what you have not expected at all in the beginning, Im immerses comes up and, and they said they're kind of jealous and they think they get inspired through the arts to again think out of the box as they had done before why now the pressure of kind of like uh, result-oriented research is so big on them. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, for instance, in Switzerland, the uh, National Science Foundation uh, is now uh, supporting artistic research, I think very much also because they like the open space. <laughs> Not they, they want to gain again this kind of freedom, and I think that's very needed. And I think when we go into that direction from the outside, we have to be careful not to be uh, restricted very much. I did a, uh, uh, once a, a symposium uh, on the term uh, genau, which is a little bit like precise also, and invited artists and scientists to talk on, you know, how important is it to be genau? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, there, there was, in the end, it was uh, clear two parties. Uh, uh, all the artists said, oh, you need to be genau. <laughs> Good art is really, really precise. And then Reinberger and the, the other molecular biologists said, no, 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 no. The interesting is where well, it is unprecise. We need the unprecise. Uh, that's, that's where really research starts. And, and as a result, I liked it very much because it is somehow, I think research is always at this kind of edge of something being sure and safe on the one hand and then totally open on the other hand. And this kind of bureaucratic idea of writing grants is only playing on the one half. And I personally, I always take these writing grants as a game, um, as a game to convince, because on the other side there's not a machine, there's somebody reading it. So it's a game to convince and show that you are able to write as if it would be sure. And to keep it open. <laughs> But that you also know a lot of this, like, it may be if, you, if you're successful, it might also just prove that you're a good grandmother. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> it's part of the game, too. That's yeah, true. But before I open up to the audience, because we have also quite a number of people from different fields here, I want to just come back to the MIT example that you showed, and that is the contribution of the arts to research, to, to have an artistic approach towards another discipline, and what does that contribute? Do you think this is an instrumentalization of the arts, or do you see a potential in that collaboration? Uh, I would say there is a clear instrumentalization, but I think as I, that's why I may mirrored the system. There are constellations where you instrumentalize as an artist, you instrumentalize the, the scientist, and vice versa. It has to be clear, you know, who is serving whom. And if it's clear in the beginning, then I think one can do that in a while. I mean, if you have an opera, 
then it's clear that the violinist is serving the singer on the stage, and it's a clear contract why you do that. Uh, I think it's very important if you can change on that. I would not like to have the artist always only serving the scientist, uh, but also vice versa. So that that can happen. Personally, I'm uh, mostly interested in those constellations where both parties do for their own, and it's even it's still working together. So a lot of these projects I've done, research projects, were not with a clear support from one side to the other, but uh, people would uh, uh, share the interest. They would share, I don't know, machines or, or experiments and so on, but they would work in the end for their own outcome. So uh, there we had, for instance, a project on EEG, uh, these measurements of, of uh, um, the brain activities, and we worked with people from, uh, from, from biology and, and uh, medicine together. And we, all, we were all fascinated by this kind of strange um, signals that are coming out. And we investigated on them by uh, making them into sound, so sonifying them. And this was clear that the, uh, the um, uh, doctors were good, very good in you know, what these might mean. And we were very good on the sound side, how to design them. And we, dis and we uh, in the beginning, I said already, when you do a publication, uh, it's clear who's first. <laughs> so so the, uh, the scientist published later in his in her journal and said something thanks to the artist that they supported me. But we also did some uh, sound installations that said, oh, thanks for the guys giving us the machines. So I think this is a. Um, an equal level of cooperation, where it must also be possible to come together, but also to leave each other again and say, this is what I want to have in the end. That's why I'm doing it. And just before we open, I, I also want to, I mean, talking about instrumentalization, and, and you, you just spoke also the, about the, the field of the sonic and so I mean, if you take, because um, I just mentioned before, also the exhibition of my colleagues, um, Germinas Nomeda Obonas, they have a MIDI ceremony in their exhibition. If you talk, think about Lev Ceremon or Nikola Tesla or so, like where very clearly it was understood. Um, or you can take Marianne Amashi, who was at the CABS. Um, the, um, what they investigated uh, that they could have a different use, there, there is a different application of the, what they invented, and that is not necessarily an artistic <coughs> one. Yeah. And, um, so you see an instrumentaliz instrumentalization there, I mean, to uh, uh, even, um, I would say, like a very radical extent if you take um, the theremin, for example. But um, on the other side, we, we had a collaborative uh, application um, in terms of um, our Earth Atmospheric Planetary Institute that wanted to have science, uh, artists joining their scientists um, on a research project in the Arctic to, to get a different reading of the same data. Like how would the artists read the data that they compile? I mean, similar like what you do here with your seismographic readers, like how do, what do you take out of it? And um, they were very optimistic uh, to, to get the funding and uh, it was initiated by the scientific side, not by us. And very clearly the funders would say, no, 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 but the artists will live at home. I mean, that does not contribute to the research um, that is planned here. So I think there is still a lot of prejudices uh, towards um, a serious contribution of the arts uh, to research. Yeah, but I think that the idea that research has to end up in usefulness is also very questionable. I mean, the, the German term Nutzen or use is, I mean, that's why the idea of basic research exists. I mean, they're, 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 you want to understand. That's the, the thing you you are doing research for, I think. Yeah, but it uh, was but not by the scientists. Again, uh, it was by the funding. But yeah, yeah, but this is, I mean, this is politics. Mm -hmm. politics. I mean, it's, uh, uh, nobody wants um, uh, scientists to understand something. They only want to give the money for getting, you know, better heating, nicer lamps, uh, more comfort, whatsoever. 
I mean, this is, this is a, a game, I would say, that science played in the last 500 years. They started also with being not funded very much, uh, if I understand the history right. And then they figured out, if we promise um, we, do, we, we go to the, the moon, and then you get these kind of very nice pans where you can fry without oil out of this. Um, this Teflon. is Teflon. So this came out apparently out of uh, astronomic research. This is also a promise. So you do the basic research with the promise that there is something that you can apply it to. Now, um, the game, the politics the game is how much do you allow the non-applicable because there's this promise of the applicable. And, and I think uh, um, today it's more and more that everybody thinks that research has to have a use in a short term. And I think uh, the, the whole artistic research movement should, or is a chance also to think in longer terms again, and think of an understanding that is... So yeah, it's more like the vending machine versus the gambling machine? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> That's good picture. <laughs> No, I, must, I mean, what I experience in this project, for instance, is that um, um, I always stop when things are getting too useful, for instance. <laughs> I, it, it's silly, I know. I, I mean, I, I, this kind of uh, um, audification of, of seismic data, you might want to use it to predict earthquakes and so on. But I never did that, because I think that's not the thing that interests me. What interested me for doing this sonification of data was to think of the Earth in, in sonic terms, to think of it as an audio environment, to think of it as an instrument, also to, to, to say to get a different idea of what the Earth might be. And this is, you know, this is, I would say, is a kind of, that's why I said models or, 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 uh, or, or representation might be an area where artistic research is in a good way collaborating with science because they have to do that too, even though if they might later come other people and do application with it. But I'm, I'm not nervous about applications. Uh. We also we have a, a room microphone, so please feel free also to put up questions or comments or so. Yeah, not that you can see. It's easier. And thank you, Mansoor. Okay. Um, so my question is, I sort of um, had some some further questions about uh, what would happen if you sort of substituted music which you use in many of your examples, um, research through art and um, art through research, uh, a more ambiguous art form like visual art uh, in which the boundaries of the form aren't so well defined. Um, it seems like, especially in the research through art example where he was sort of creating new instruments for a new art form, if, if that had instead been um, like uh, visual, it really would have been sort of a non-artistic pursuit, uh, like just trying to um, create a new uh, medium somehow. And then uh, like if um, frequency analysis of and making uh, the voice out of out of music. What if if that had been sort of a visualization? That maybe we would just call that sort of like notation or a form of writing. So my question is: Is it possible to really substitute all sorts of fine forms of art into into those positions? Yeah, usually. Um, all the examples, uh, or most, 90% of the examples in the discussion of artistic research are from the visual arts. And that's why I was, uh, uh, when I prepared this talk for my students, I had also musicians in there and I thought, why not, you know, starting 
ones from that position. I'm not sure. Uh, uh, actually, I don't agree that um, that uh, uh, that it is easier in the in the sonic than in the visual because there's one really huge argument against research in in in, in music is from 19th century that those days music was the master art because it was not representing anything. So in a way it is so more ambiguous and more, you know, on the on the feeling side and so on. So it's usually it's I would say it's much more difficult to do it in, in music context, these kind of examples. Uh, I did the uh, the other the, the ten laws were all visual. So I think it's um you can do that easily also with uh, visual examples the same trying to to compare stuff. I mean, we can do it maybe afterwards with a coffee and think of, of examples. Um, and oh, maybe I should have mentioned something. I'm, uh, um, I, uh, I also read once uh, Foucault and his idea of order of thing. So this kind of trying to make it into a scheme was a little bit, um, you know, uh, ironic too, because in reality, never a project is only one side. You know, you always have. You know, it might serve a bit uh, research, or it might, you know, being influenced by it. I, so there's really, you know, examples where it is only research on art or only research through art. I think are, I think are very rare. But I wanted to set this up as a help of you know aspects uh, on on that kind of relation. Um, <clears throat> yeah, very, very interesting talk, thanks. Um, in, in your 10 laws, in your manifesto, uh, you avoided the, the topic of uh, gener generalizability, I guess for good reasons. I, I still would like to ask you, uh, what do you think? Can artistic knowledge be generalizable? Oh, sorry. And uh, a second question would be, uh, Talking, it's it's also something uh, talking about the scope of research that is uh, is not really discussed in, in artistic research. Uh, talking about uh, explora exploratory dis um, exploratory research, uh, descriptive research, or uh, explanatory research. Uh, <coughs> where is artistic research uh, in, in 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 this uh, aspect? Mm -hmm. um. The first is uh, is very interesting point I think, um, and I mentioned this in the in the potentials. I think that um, there is a major problem in scientific research with understanding things that are not generalizable. I would say, and this is uh, fascinates me. I give you uh, from this one project uh, um, an example. Um, there was a group of uh, sociologists investing on um, people who are heading hospitals, leading hospitals. And uh, since some time, there are not only doctors becoming leaders of hospitals, but more and more people from the marketing and, 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 and bureaucratic training. And there's always a big battle between these two attitudes because they don't like each other. So they did an investigation on leaders of hospitals and did interviews with them uh, where the these guys would talk about, you know, how how what their idea of leadership is, and that was a a folder of 1,500 pages, and that was our starting point. This folder, and um, and the sociologist would uh, do their uh, generalization by sociological methods, which means you know read it, try to get the focus. Uh, mark some words, uh, trying to condense these words again, discourse, and so on and so on, ending up with a kind of a diagram which says these 1,500 pages are like this. What was the article? Now the starting point was that these uh, researchers were not very satisfied with their outcome. That's why they 